All right, I think we'll get started. Wish we had more folks to enjoy this awesome talk, but uh, there are lots. Um, a few announcements before we get going. Uh, remember, please balance your pocket devices, pocket computers. It's going to be a, a sonorific event, so we don't want any interruptions. If you do have to take a phone call, please step outside. I'd be really helpful. So feel free to use the restrooms up front. I don't see anybody that doesn't know all stuff already. Um, a couple announcements for events. Uh, Friday's uh, Valentine's Day dinner. Standard Friday dinner, no reservations, but it'll be decorated elegantly. So bring your bow and come have Friday dinner. Um, Mid Raiders is Saturday. One day signups are still available. Sign up if you want to just race. Jim. If you are going to crew with somebody, we have a couple folks looking for crew, so if you want to sail, you guys want to sail. You have your hand in the air, we'll get you again to people. Ricky's wanting to sail. Here you go, Stefan. Come Ricky. Ricky. Where's Ricky? Um, um, you're on the <laughs> part, of course. Thank Next you. week, we have Mercury in the Ocean by Carl Lambert. He'll be talking about Mercury in the Ocean and fish and terrestrial and kind of a cool uh, scientific overview of uh, Mercury and what he studies at the UCSC. The following week will be Wine Tasting Potluck, bringing a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon, three dollars, a dish to share, it's wine appropriate, and six tasting glasses are optional but very useful. Um, February 29th, Mini Boat Regatta. I'm not real smart about the Mini Boat Regatta. Is there any details people need to know about Mini Boat Regatta? Just show up. Just show up. All the materials are here. All right, that's a good deal. So, uh, and then uh, March 4th, we're going to be talking about birds on Monterey Bay with um, Emma Kelsey from the U.S. Geological Survey. So she's a little clever about birds, and she's going to come talk about what we see here in the bay, what we're most likely to see, and what would be really exciting to see here on the water, and kind of how to understand <coughs> where birds come from and why they're here. So it should be a pretty good thing. March 7th is the crab feed, and it's right into the first Wednesday night sale of the year. So. Come, come quickly. Any other announcements I missed from the audience? No? Okay. Well, uh, I'm pretty excited about this talk tonight. Uh, Dr. John Ryan uh, is excellent at giving out uh, his information, his knowledge to the public. Uh, I hear lots of people know him around town. Kira actually heard him talk on campus and said, You got to talk to this guy. It turns out he advises one of our other pals. So he's a a whirlwind of information and is all ever present. He graduated from the University of Massachusetts, um, then worked in ocean sciences and terrestrial wildlife biology, so not always an ocean guy. But then he went and got his PhD uh, in biological oceanography from the University of Rhode Island. Top quiz What is the mascot of the University of Rhode Island? <laughs> it's kind of funny, that's a, that's a hint. No, Close. Squid. No, no. <laughs> it's Rody the Ram. Huh? Rody Ram. That's terrible. <laughs> um, once he graduated from Rhode Island, he came to the Monterey Bay Aquarium's uh, research institute down in Moss Landing, where he's been studying all sorts of really super cool stuff phytoplankton, ecology, um, and, uh, oh, excuse me, was that it? At, uh, sorry, that was it. They were about part of me. Um, but you now he's, um, he's working at uh, working on biological and chemical oceanography research, which is is way beyond my understanding of things. Um, but his enthusiasm for science and engineering collaborating together uh, is a good fit for Ambar. And like I said, he reaches out to people all over the place, so he, he passes that information on to on the new students at the UCSD and that sort of stuff. It's really exciting for. Him. Our community to have. So, without that, please help me welcome uh, John Ryan. <laughs> and, and little little thing is, uh, there is a lot of sounds going to be coming out of this box here, so be aware if you're sound sensitive. Okay. Thank <laughs> <laughs> 
So uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity to be here. Always fun to uh, share uh, the ocean soundscape. It's a dimension of the ocean we don't normally experience. Even if we stick our head under water, you know, we're often near the shore where there's surf break or maybe the noise from our own scuba regulator. It's hard to really capture the fullness of the sound that's moving through the ocean all the time. So yeah, I'm at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research too. I went there for a two year job 21 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture of it in the air. And really wonderful facility. Let's start with the big picture of why listen? Why listen in the ocean? Why record and analyze sound, really? Well, <clears throat> marine life, including especially marine mammals, use sound for all of their essential life activities communication, navigation, foraging, reproduction. And so just by recording and analyzing sound, we can learn a lot about their lives. Uh, of course, most of the ocean is largely dark. You know, if you were out in the middle of Monterey Bay and you swam down about 100 feet, 99% of the light that was available at the surface would be gone. So most of the ocean is dark. And these many of these animals, of course, are carrying out their life activities in the dark. So they're using sound. Naturally, they've evolved to use sound. And sound can travel really far in the ocean, too. Two blue whales separated by 900 miles could hear each other. There's um, observations of call and response between blue whales hundreds of miles apart. So sound is really critical in the ocean, and NOAA has long protected habitats and species. And the realization, the growing realization over about the last decade is that, well, the acoustic habitat is really important. 
we're putting a lot of noise into the ocean and that can interfere with the lives of many marine animals. And that may be particularly important to endangered species and the species where we need to be protecting. So what can noise do? What can our noise do? Obviously it can, like it would if we were, um, you know, trying to have a conversation next to a construction site, it can impair, um, our, it can mask what we're trying to hear. Uh, it can cause behavioral disturbance. For example, animals might leave a habitat that is critical to their survival because we're making too much noise there. So they can't get the food resources they need. It can cause acute or chronic stress. For example, this is a crazy example. People happen to be taking samples from uh, beluga whales in the Northwest Atlantic when 9-11 happened. That event shut down shipping for a number of days and the ocean got a lot quieter and the people were continuing to sample the animals and found that their stress hormone levels dropped way down when it went quiet. That means the rest of the time their stress levels are up. <laughs> and of course physiological damage, if the noise is incredibly loud, which some sound sources are, uh, can physically damage tissues. Or in the case of beaked whales, which are the most dramatic example we've probably seen beaching in the Caribbean, they're uh, hunting for food incredibly deep. And when they heard the Navy sonar, they panicked. And they rocketed to the surface. So it's like getting a severe case of the bands. So it can be direct or indirect. So how do we listen? In this case, all the sounds we just heard were recorded, um, I would say in Monterey, but, but almost. <laughs> we'll see where that location is. So we're gonna fly in the lost landing and uh, <coughs> Of course, Slu and Mari is right here. Uh, that's my office right there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this cable runs 30 miles across the northern shelf, avoiding the SoCal Canyon, of course. That's the integrity of the cable hits to the edge of the continental shelf where the slope steepens and it runs down to this feature here called Smooth Ridge. Now we'll get a view of the Mars node itself right after it was deployed. There's the cable coming in from shore. Here's where we plug in our science experiments. There are eight ports. And you know, it's kind of, oh, okay. So yes, zooming out, what you can see is that we're listening in kind of a natural geological amphitheater open to the Pacific. So it's a really great listening location. Um, and what's crazy, you know, here you are, 900 meters below the surface, about 3,000 feet down in corrosive salt water, you just plug in an electrical device and it works. <laughs> <laughs> the connector to do that costs $25,000, but it works. <laughs> so it's a great location to listen because we're in that, we're open to the Pacific right here. We're also sitting in the middle of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And working in, in the sanctuary is, is wonderful. There's so much interdisciplinary research going on, so many opportunities to collaborate, and for our science to inform management. So that's another reason it's a, a great location. We don't, we've got shipping lanes right there, which, you know, shipping is a traditional noise source uh, that, that we study. And it's also a great location to listen because we're along the northeast margin of the Pacific, which is the eastern boundary uplying system where the winds that drive your sails also drive, um, ultimately drive the surface waters away from the coast. That creates the upwelling and the deep water that upwells is not only responsible for the invention of the wetsuit, <laughs> but also for supplying nutrients that fertilize the ecosystem of many species. What does a day, what does sound look like first of all? We can represent sound, uh, it's intensity and color. So lower intensities in blues and purple, higher intensities in warmer colors, reds. And what you're looking at here is, on this axis is frequency, this is five hertz. Here's the li lower limit of our hearing. And here's the upper limit of our hearing, 20 kilohertz. And then we're going quite a bit higher, up to 100 kilohertz. But, so this is frequency, and this is time, this is one day. You can see the and outside, our range of hearing. Humpback whales singing their songs. We're gonna look at this a good bit. Blue whales singing their songs, fin whales. Some of their calls, we'll hear more later. Boats traveling by, 
the wind picking up in the afternoon, earthquakes way down here. So the soundscape captures a lot, uh, a lot of information, and really, it's um. Yeah, so I guess this is not, you don't need to know this. <laughs> so what are our project goals? For research, we want to understand the presence and activity of marine mammals, their relationships to ecosystem variation, and the nature and consequences of our noise. For education, we're aiming to enrich educational programs and media with these recordings and scientific content. And I'll summarize kind of how we've been trying to do that, or how it's just happened and taken on a life of its own. Uh, we have a, quite a project team I want to acknowledge and say, people working in marine operations, engineering, research, and education. We collaborate with a lot of people in this region, NOAA, Naval Coast Graduate School, Scripps further down the coast, Stanford Hopkins Marine Station, Los Angeles Marine Labs, UC Santa Cruz, lots of great collaborations here. Let's start with humpback whales. Uh, we're in a humpback whale BIA. Didn't Billy Joel sing a song or something like that? <laughs> no. So BIA is a biologically important area, and the colors in this map represent estimates of the density of humpback whales based on a lot of sighting data and some mathematical methods. And so what this, these authors can show really clearly is that right off here, here off central California, including Monterey Bay, we've got this really intense region of, of sightings. So there, this is great habitat. Really good that we're listening right here. <clears throat> Let's turn to the focus, which is humpback whale song. You heard a phrase from a song. So humpback whales, the shortest sound you will hear from them is called a song unit. A unit is organized into a phrase. They'll repeat a phrase as a theme, and then a collection of themes is a song. And then they might sing that song for a whole day. <laughs> so here's an example of a song. Here you've got, again, warmer colors meaning sound energy at a given frequency and time. And you can see, almost like a sheet of music, they've arranged these song units, starting up here in the higher frequency range, dropping into the mid, dropping into the lower, and finishing, uh, finishing with the mid and low range. But look at, I don't know, it's maybe a little hard to see, but look at this whole 14 minute period here. And then look at this one. <laughs> so they, you know, it's real close to replication, but they also, if I may anthropomorphize, they do improvise. <laughs> <laughs> they, they mix it up, and uh, so I've seen almost exact repeats, and then jazz singers of the ocean. <laughs> so let's listen to a little bit of humpback whale song chorusing. Here you have two or three animals. We don't know, because we just have this... One omnidirectional hydrophone picking up sound from anywhere. But have a listen. snippet from a few singing whales. And what's amazing about humpback whale song is it's part of their culture. It's part of their cultural transmission. What do I mean by that? Well, a population will share a song. They all get in tune singing the same song. But when they learn other song elements from other individuals or groups, they might like it and incorporate it into their song. And the most dramatic example is, is this study here, which showed two 
whales, male humpback whales, by the way, it's only the males that say, they traveled from the Indian Ocean, Western Australia, over to Pacific Ocean, off Eastern Australia. There were two of them, and they entered a population of 82 singers. And over a period of two years, their song completely replaced the song that was there. <laughs> <laughs> so, must have been a better song. <laughs> it was at the top of the charts for years. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, also, there's these uh, studies have shown that there are places where the sharing of this culture is intensified because the animals, maybe they're coming along, they can learn and exchange song ideas. So, and I think we live in one. We live in a convergence. Why? Because it's where many whales aggregate. And there's density-dependent effects on how, how much you learn from, from your peers. So this first study I'm going to summarize is a, it's only about one question. When does humpback whale song happen here? We're not breeding grounds of Central California. That's much further south. And song is typically associated with breeding behavior. So when do we hear it here in this ultimately foraging and migratory habitat? Well, let's look at every time scale simply. This is day night. And this is just solar elevation. So it gives us the determination of when in the daily cycle this is happening. And what you see is that night time, during the seasonal peak in song, most of it's happening at night. You know, close to 70% of the time during the night detects song. Get the dawn and dusk and it drops off a bit. Get into the daylight and it continues to drop off towards solar noon. There's definitely a light dependent uh, influence on this behavior. Now let's look at seasonal. We're looking at uh, July through June. And you can see the annual peak during uh, November, December in particular. And of course, this is the time of year when they are getting ready to or already migrating south for breeding, breeding season. And from the time they first start singing in the fall to the end of the peak in January, as it's tailing off, you can see song length increases. So their songs are getting at least longer, perhaps more complex. And um, this is just uh, a reference, day length, just showing how the song peak has somewhat inverse to day length. It's a winter, largely winter phenomenon. And then lastly, um, this shows the number of humpback whale sightings per trip. Monterey Bay Whale Watch. They're on the water on the average 320 days per year. So it's biased data. They're going where they're going to find whales. But it's biased 320 days per year, <laughs> which is really good sampling. So, but the point is just that you can see song peaking November, December. Here, this, the presence in sightings stays high into November, but begins to drop off in December. Um, because they're starting to migrate south. However, we're, we would still hear animals that are migrating past our hydrophone, just passing by Monterey Bay. Okay, so next time scale, which is really a big deal in this ecosystem, is interannual, year to year. We have huge changes in this ecosystem, year to year. Here's our first year of recording, second and third. And right away, your eye would pick out some major changes between the first and second year. Song increased 44%. Between the second and third, another 55%. So, you know, we can think of, we want to evaluate all the hypotheses for what would cause this, this pattern in nature. And the way we're going to do that is to take an ecosystem level Q. Meaning, uh, we want to compare <clears throat> what we're hearing with what we're seeing, and you've seen some of the sighting data. But we want to look at the bigger picture, sea level and winds. Physics that drive this, this ecosystem. Uh, primary productivity, what is happening at the very core of the food web that feeds the entire uh, ocean web of life? What about uh, the productivity that contains toxins that can affect the brains and nervous systems of these whales? And of course, what are the whales eating? So let's take a, a quick look through the different hypotheses. Here's that simple summary. Year one, year two, year three, saw more than double. 
And the simplest hypothesis is there was more song because more whales. <laughs> Whale watch data says. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got other hypotheses. But as we turn to the other hypotheses about behavior, we need this big picture uh, perspective that we can get from sea level. We have satellite radar altimeters orbiting the Earth and observing the entire uh, globe, including our California current system. And what you're looking at here is sea level anomaly. If it's high, it's warm. The waters are warm. If it's low, the waters are cold. And what you can see is during this 25-year record, quarter century, we happened to start our listening during the highest sea level anomalies of the last quarter century. Really anomalous period that we dropped into. And you can see over the next two years, uh, sea level drops to closer to normal, kind of leveled out. So major physical change in the ecosystem. And let's look at those warm temperatures that cause the high sea level. This is the so-called warm blob. <laughs> uh, and so in 2015, when we were first listening, it was warm everywhere in the California current system. Much closer to normal in the next two years. Slightly warm, but some negative cool anomalies as well. And we have a robotic glider that slices through the upper ocean, leaving Monterey Bay, going offshore every month. And what we could see is that you're looking now from the surface to two meter depth, offshore to near shore. You can see this warm anomaly in the first year was constant, was intensified toward the coast and toward the surface. And this is the foraging habitat of humpback whales. So there's this huge physical footprint uh, right where they need to be foraging for food. In the next two years, see how the near shore zone became much closer to normal. So the satellite and a robot in the ocean tell us major changes in humpback habitat. So the next simplest hypothesis is that this upward trend in song, doubling, was caused by increasing uh, detectability of song. And that could happen in two ways. The first way is <clears throat> if the animals moved, um, let me flip that around. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into the hydrography, but we can talk about that during the question period if you're interested. Let's focus on this map, which shows the received level, the intensity of sound that will be received at our hydrophone from a whale anywhere around here, right? So what you can see is we hear the whales best when they're close to our hydrophone. <laughs> and uh, we can hear them from quite, quite far away. Uh, if we get into the bay, we couldn't hear it quite as well if they were up in the Northeast Bay. So let's say during those warm conditions, question from a, and we're using just a theoretical model to address this question. Um, the reason we're looking at this is because previous study by researchers who were looking at sea turtles and uh, uh, marine mammals, what they found is during an El Nino, when the conditions are similarly warm, the humpback whales moved into the bay. It was preferential habitat. And we're sitting here in deep water, so if they move into the bay, we might not hear them as well. Well, short story is, this is the received level going toward the shore and away from the shore. And if we compare how the received level falls off onshore versus offshore, it's not a big difference. So if they did move into the bay, like during an El Nino, that wouldn't explain the much lower song levels in that first year. So now we look at the ecosystem. There's our humpback <clears throat> song, doubling. This is the wind, the winds that drive up welling and sailing. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, very strong increase over these three years in cumulative wind driven up on. This is the microscopic algae that grow as a result of this wind also increasing greatly over these three years. So the core of the food web got ignited for three years. This is the food the whales actually eat. <laughs> Started with really low abundance of, of krill in that very warm year. By the time we got to the third year, really uh, abundant krill, their, their primary food. And then lastly, 
that neurotoxin, that's that compound that's produced by microscopic algae that can addle their brains, in you and me, it would cause amnesic shellfish poisoning. And then it can cause um, neurological damage and death, heart damage as well. Anyway, that toxin was off the charts in that first year. We had the most toxic bloom we've ever seen in Monterey Bay in that first year. And then it, it decreased during these years. So the, this ecosystem level view, here's the summary, the rat. Physics drove a lot of productivity and a lot of food, which is good for whales. They would presumably have more energy for song behavior as time went on. And the thing that can add their brains went away. <laughs> so, so yeah, this is um, how we try to develop this ecosystem level perspective on what we're listening to. So th that whole study was about when the song occurs, but there's so much information in the structure of the song and how it evolves through time. But we can't really hear the structure of that song because it's happening on whale time and they're slow, <laughs> right? So what we do to hear the structure of the song, the song. So I'm gonna play you a single humpback song at 8X speed. Dropping the pitch gradually, um, how they're combining phrases, and how that phrase changes to a theme, etc. And so, you know, it's a mountain of data. For those of you into data, one little hydrophone, two terabytes a month. It's a lot of, it's a lot of data. So we need tools like machine learning that help us <clears throat> sift through this mountain of data. So all I want to point out here is. Here are some of those song units you just heard, right? Here's an up sweep that'd be kind of like a then. So what, what I want you to notice is that a machine learning algorithm with no training from us looked at this data and said, well, I'll assign this orange topic to this one and I'll assign this green topic to this one. The point is, this is a, a, an algorithm that's discovering the structure of the song without us having to train it. So that's kind of the direction we're, we're moving. Um, now, blue whales, largest, most massive animal to have ever lived on Earth to this day. And um, they sing too. They sing songs. And here's an example of blue whale song. In this case, you're looking at 32 minutes or so. Uh, here's one of their song types. It's an A call. A. There. The pulse train, and it sounds like this. Ship noise there. This next blue whale call is very therapeutic, so I'm going to turn up the subwoofer. <laughs> it is actually, it's really nice to just let this one soak in. So it's a two part, often a two part call. It's a tonal, so it'll just go on for about 10 se seconds, slight pause, and they'll drop the pitch a little bit and do one more. So that looks like, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's part one, there's part two. Part one, part two. Let's see what that sounds like. 
feels like. Second, third harmonic. The third harmonic is the one we analyze. The point of this is just to say these whales completely dominate the low frequency end in terms of total energy, sound energy put into the water. So you see this peak here at the third harmonic, it's well above background. The point is just that, yes, we have low frequency shift noise, but these biological sound sources are dominant. And so what are the three song units? We've got the A, the pulse train you heard, the B, that you just heard, and the C, which is before every B, there's a C. A, B, C. Scientists are very creative about how they name things. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, um, what I want to show you here is how we work together with other people who put sensors on whales. So we're just sitting in one place, listening for five years. What are we here? We hear this pattern. Here's that annual cycle, also peaking in November, just like compact whales. Here's that annual cycle, but it's separated out by night, day, and up, dawn. What I want you to notice is the difference between night and day, which is represented here. A difference, night minus day. See how there's much more song occurring at night, particularly early in the song season, and then they begin to converge. We get closer together. So there's a shift from a lot more song at night, less during the day, to more even, day and night. Well, a hydrophone can tell us about what's happening at the population level, but to, to understand what, what's causing that, we need to look at the individual level. And we're working with Jeremy Goldfogan's lab at Stanford. That's Will A. Strike, who's doing his dissertation with us. And he put that tag on. <laughs> So they, they approach it on a rig, and they have a long pole, and they just slap a suction cup on the back of the animal. And it'll stay on for up to a day or so. And the, it has on it a hydrophone, measure sound, an accelerometer, so you know how the animal's positioned in the water column. And the accelerometer, if it picks up a, a call, you know it's from that animal. Because the hydrophone can pick it up from the animal over here, but the accelerometer tells you, that's my animal call. Uh, and then it's got video, etc. But here's what we learned from the tags on the animals. This is just um, a relatively short time period, about a day. And this is the animal's dive path. It's, it's diving deep repeatedly. It comes up to get its air, it goes back down to get something. <laughs> and that something, uh, it, with the accelerometer, they can tell when the animal is lunging forward to, to take in a whole lot of something. <laughs> Which is this, yeah. Down here at the shelf break uh, depths, or, or even just through the water column, you'll find these krill swarms. Right? So if you could open your mouth like a parachute, <laughs> you'd get a lot of energy in one gulp. <clears throat> I could swim around in this and get some, I'm quite sure. <laughs> I might have to go and then, okay, what's happening is during the day, they're feeding a lot. And they're not singing. Now, that's the blue dots feeding. The red dots are song currency. So we move into the evening and night, and they're doing a lot more singing and a lot less feeding. So early in the season, that's what that population level pattern we saw was. More song at night. Now, this is a longer term tag from an animal. Two weeks here now. Uh, at, oh, sorry, a month. <laughs> and what you're looking at is the animal hanging around a certain latitude. And at that latitude, it's feeding a lot during the day. Day is in white here. Most of the feeding is happening during the day. Then all of a sudden, this animal starts heading south. Time to migrate. And as it heads south, 
<clears throat> it goes from a period of mostly feeding during the day and um, mostly calling at night to calling day and night. So here's that pattern we saw at the population level on the individual. And that's the type of integration we need to understand uh, these complex beings. <laughs> so they stop feeding when you're migrating? They feed a lot less. And there's an, so what you, the story I just told is seasonal modulation of day night behavior. There's another step that the student is working on, which is interannual modulation of seasonal modulation of day night because the ecosystem is so different from year to year. And they might delay that transition. If they, if feeding is good, they'll stock up on energy and they'll delay that transition to uh, the breeding behavior. Yes, interrupt me at all, I mean, all times with questions. And, uh, so we originally deployed this hydrophone, which, you know, size of a Coke can. Uh, and then we swapped it out after a couple of years because it was recommended that we do that. Turns out it, it's doing fine in the deep ocean. Then we worked with the Naval Coast Graduate School to put out this funny looking thing, which has a sock on it. <laughs> it's a directional hydrophone. So instead of just saying, oh, I heard a blue whale, I heard a blue whale from over there. <laughs> so it can tell you the direction of the sound source, which opens up many possibilities for studying their ecology. And here's an example where here we are listening on the directional hydrophone, and here is where the Stanford group slapped one of those tags on the back of a blue whale so that they knew where it was, and the tag recorded that this whale was putting out a lot of sound. Okay? Then on the directional hydrophone, we confirmed, yep, we're hearing those calls from that whale, and the directional hydrophone says it's over here. <laughs> so now here's the Here's the data from this time period when the hydrophone was hearing this whale. And this is um, just a simple summary that says, on this axis, as it goes higher, there's more sound energy coming from a whale. So wherever you've got high numbers here, it's, it's your whale. And what you can see is, in this whole region where we're getting strong energy, it's in, in the region from about, say, 130 to 170 degrees. Uh, this is zero, 90, about, you know, kind of here to here. And sure enough, the, uh, the whale uh, <clears throat> moved over time in this direction, sweeping here to here. So it, it, we've done this with multiple whales. We're convinced it's working. And this allows us to think about studying how these blue whales change their habitat use when it's upwelling or when the winds relax. Or as, a, as the season changes, as they come in from the north, do they start in the northern bay habitat? And then later in the year move to the southern bay? Well, that's what we're going to study with this directional hydrophone as the first topic. We are interested in uh, cryptic and critically endangered species. Here's a pygmy sperm whale. And we just don't know much about their global distributions, where they live, how they live. So if we hear them on our hydrophone, it's kind of a big deal. So what, what we just did, and I just got heard from Harley Perkins today. So the thing about them is they're putting out echolocation clicks to find their food, like a like a acoustic flashlight in the dark, bouncing sound off their food and, and seeing with that sound. Well, if they're putting out such a high frequency, like more than five times above our limit of hearing. So what we did is we turned up the sample rate of our hydrophone. Instead of sampling only a quarter million times per second, we turn it up to a half million times per second, because that was the only way to confirm whether or not we were hearing this species. And sure enough, it's hard to see them. You can get binoculars out of them, but they're small, cryptic. So listening all the time is a much more probable way to pick them up, to know if they're using our habitat. And of course, the North Pacific white whale, the most endangered whale species today, about 30 individuals left. And so if we hear them, that's a big deal. We know that if they're if they're here at all using this habitat, that's a really important management consideration for protection. And just to touch on antrophony, our noise. This is a noise source we hear a lot. 
Um, what you're going to hear, you'll hear some dolphin whistles, and then you'll hear these. These are some operations for one of two purposes. One, to get marine mammals out of your nets, because you can't haul in your nets with fish and mammals out. This is permitted, it's not really regulated. And it's a massive noise source. Let's use the modeling from Naval Post Graduate School again. Imagine you threw one of the It gets to about 10 feet before it explodes. And here it is at 10 feet, and this hole here is in quite high sound levels from that one explosion. And we hear as many as 88 per hour. Not really as bad as Southern California, as many as 500 per hour. Uh, this, uh, if you were to slice through the water column here, you would end up going across, right, and even down. So they only go off at night. Uh, not only at night. In fact, here's night shaded and day not shaded for every hour of every day for the first three and a half years of listening. Uh, the size of the circle represents the number of detections per hour. And these are all confirmed. I manually confirmed them all. 11 hours. <laughs> Oh, tedious work. <laughs> but yeah, you can see most of this happening during the night. And that's consistent with what they find off Southern California, squid fishery. Because marine mammals, especially sea lions, love the bowl of food called squid in the first scene then. Um, then just lastly to highlight some of the education, what we're doing to share, like we share the data for research all the time. You can go to the listening line. Pick your sound source. Okay, so here you go, ready? Alexa, ask the soundscape to play on that whale. Here's a six minute, 43 seconds recording of a single humpback whale song. They can repeat songs for many hours. Destination free, public for free. And uh, here's what the exhibit looks like it's basically 10 different sounds. And you, you push a button and you don't know what that sound will be, but you then a reveal of what that sound was. It was a humpback whale showing up. And uh, I'm working with the aquarium on their new D2021 exhibit to provide a soundscape. Our summer intern, Daniel Van um, we've got 8 million views on his video. <laughs> Basically, he came from a background of a musical family, but he engaged with us to learn about the science of sound. And that's what this slide minute video is about. Because we use some of Google's technology to use to machine learning to detect and classify Google. Anyway, we got ended up unexpectedly getting into that documentary, and then the BBC came out. Why? Because the BBC producer was out for Big Blue Live 2015, and a breaching whale landed on. So he figured he needed to come back and explore, you know, pretty find his whale. So it's a really fun story. Um, we didn't end up getting much science in there, just me staring out the window. <laughs> anyway, don't, don't get me started. <laughs> Uh, Monterey Symphony, we did a water theme concert with them, which um, um, actually rewind. The BBC documentary is beautiful and fun and engaging for the public. The science geeks just always want more science. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. So Monterey Symphony, they did a water theme concert. We brought to school groups, um, uh, music festival, Tom Muscle, the um, BBC producer. Um, brought these recordings and did storytelling at this uh, festival in the UK. Our recordings went to Roots Cathedral, a burning man, last year. <laughs> well, you know, it's just people, it's a way for people to connect with ocean life. Uh, we've got some immersive experiences. Yolanda Harris at UC Santa Cruz does the sound walks. Josh Miller, also known as the musical yogi. 
Uh, the, they have taken this on tour. <laughs> you know, it's a yoga studio tour. So yeah, that's kind of some of what we're doing in research and outreach. And I'd answer questions. Uh, can the whale watchers bring a, a bunch of uh, you know, visitors out on their boat and place some sort of whale sounds to attract uh, whale? Are they at, at, at that stage yet? To know what kind of sounds you can you know, send out to actually bring whales in? Yeah, I think the whale watch boats usually just go by what's been happening recently and what they hear by calling people. No, I'm just saying, could you? You have that, that kind of information? Well, you know, we. Hard to study whales. <laughs> what I mean is, if you have captive animals, you can evaluate behavioral response um, more easily. However, what you're getting at is behavioral response. How do they respond to this sound when I put it into the water? Yeah. Well, the first issue is there are regulations on what sound we can put into the water. And so we there would be maybe some cautions about that for a researcher trying to do that research. Instead, what people have focused on is Oh, we want to know about how does a blue whale respond when a giant container vessel is coming its way? Why? Because ship strikes kill a lot of whales. Well, what they learn by the, through behavioral response studies is the animal made no evasive maneuvers, left or right. It just slowly submerged. And when you've got a container vessel with a whole lot of ships still below the surface, that doesn't save you. <laughs> so there are those types of responses. Behavioral response studies mainly aim at reducing mortalities and <clears throat> simulated Navy sonar is another common one. And the Navy does these studies down off Southern California where they still have active, you know, uh, exercise sites where they create a lot of noise. <laughs> so they fund whale researchers to study the response to noise. I've never heard of anybody attracting whales through putting out song. Well, same thing. I mean, you know, putting them on a freighter or something like that to put that alarming whale sound to keep a whale away from. Yeah. Well, I've wondered what are the what, how can we better keep sea lions out of fishing nets? Um, yeah. And whether it's <laughs> okay. So here's what one idea is: you can put out the sound of their natural predator. However, what they might do is crowd your boat because it feels like protection, <laughs> um, right? So, and I asked, I went on the dock, went over the dock and talked with a couple of fishermen for about two and a half hours. And I said, if anybody's gonna find a better way, it's the people who know the fishing gear, know the animals are out there every day, <clears throat> it's you guys. So what about a decoy? What you've told me you can get me anchovy out of a bucket from your net for my research. What if you had a pulley system that drove those anchovy out to the bow and water. So then <clears throat> the sea lions had free fish that they didn't have to go through a net to get. Well, anyway, the, the point is we were thinking about too. How does the volume of what you hear in the ocean compare to what you play here? Would you yeah. Say it's loud or? Yeah, it's a uh, good question. Great question. Um, I wish we could experience this underwater, but no one will let me submerge this room. <laughs> so, yeah. But because think about it, if you're immersed in water, the medium you're in is much closer to the density of your body tissues. And the sound would just kind of move right in. It would take on a sense of touch. So for, there's that first, you know, sort of big picture difference. We're listening in air. This submorpher is pretty good at moving air. So you get a sense of this really deep rumble. Things rattle. That's great. But <laughs> But the short story is these large green mammals make the loudest sounds of any life form on earth. Um, it can harm you physically if you're too close and it oh, sends sounds right into you. It could actually cause a problem for you. It's that intense. Yeah. So what about interspecies? Do they each other or react to each other's sounds or behave differently when they hear a sound from another? It's a good question. It's like so many of these questions are how can I get into their heads? 
<laughs> right? And the best we can often do is observe their behavior in relation to what we're hearing. And observing their behavior is, is not so simple. You know, so, but Jesus, uh, they have, the, we, you know, many marine mammals, except the ones you can't get into captivity, their hearing profiles have been studied. So you know what frequencies they hear. At least. So you know if they can hear this species or that. But there are certainly cases where not only are animals vocalizing or using echolocation at such a high frequency that other, many other species couldn't even hear it. But the theory is, for example, that harbor porpoise drove their echolocation to such high frequencies to avoid being detected by orca. <laughs> There's that type of theory. When you get a, um, a signal that's uh, multiple species, is it really easy to separate all the different sounds? Are there, are there songs and calls unique enough that you can always tell how many animals are being picked at that one time? Yeah, good question. You know, like when I showed the blue whale song example, mostly that was blue whale sound, but there were fin whales tucked in between two blue whale frequencies. So it just makes you think about how over long periods, evolution drove them to use different channels. <laughs> and then humpback whales, the next largest, perhaps that we hear around here, it's dipping into the range that blues use, but very little. It's, and it's occupying a much broader frequency range, but they absolutely overlap with orcas and dolphins, humpbacks do. So the short story is all we're doing is picking up sound that comes to our hydrophone at any given time and it's it's mixed and the attributes of the sound that's recorded from one source will be modified by interaction with that with waves from another sound source so it can distort and change and make it really hard for us to tease apart so when i study as we go to study humpback whale song structure and its evolution i'm going through and i'm finding time periods where number one background is really quiet. I don't have to deal with wind hits as much. Uh, and I'm also looking for times when it's one. It's, it's um, the example I played of two of coursing humpbacks, that's really hard to pull apart. Okay. <laughs> I thought I'd put the second microphone out there so we can keep trying to it. Yeah, that's been a possibility as it as it happens, the technology for these vector sensor hydrophones, they're using, <clears throat> so you know how I showed that example of the hydrophone pointing to where blue whale was? That's actually not using an array to triangulate within the interior. It's actually, number one, a hydrophone to record the, the sound, but it's, then it's a three axis accelerometer that on a small scale that allows them to determine unambiguously the direction. And you had a second one you could try to get it. far. Yeah, yeah, we thought about because the hydrophone gives yeah. you it's in this direction and it's vertical and horizontal. Yeah. So if vertical could be accurate, which I don't think it is, maybe we could get it to the point where it is, but you can get a sense of range by knowing your depth and vertical. So you must know a little bit about the acoustics of the ocean and how that varies. Depth and salinity and temperature. Does that help you understand what you hear? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I mean, when they here's an example. Why? Um, so here, theory? let me give you an example that I didn't talk about here. Remember how we were listing all all the hypotheses for how it is we could hear a doubling of song in three years from humpback whales. I, the, one, the example I blew by is this. Okay, what if the ocean, when it was really warm, uh, placed the picnic line or this, the steep density gradient deeper in the water column? And if the whales are singing up here, now they've got, instead of it being up here, if that deep density layer is steeper in the water column, it might intercept more of the sound energy from the song. And then we would hear less. So, my point is the, the, the density of the water column, the density profile of the water column is very important 
and we analyze years of data to, to answer that hypothesis? The short answer is nope. Even though the whole ocean was warmer, the density profile remained consistent. The, the strength of the density gradients in that picnic line remained consistent. So that wouldn't have affected how well we could hear. That's just one applied study. Is that getting at some of what you're interested in? Yeah, well, I didn't know if whales uh, might know their acoustics well, but they sing songs at different depths because of the propagation properties of those depths. Well, now that you mention it, we're at 900 meters depth. <laughs> we're in the sound channel, the so called uh, so far channel, where it's the sound speed minimum which traps sound energy and allows it to propagate further through the ocean. So we can hear farther away than we otherwise would. That's good and bad. If you want to study your local soundscape, it's like, well, I'm hearing one from 400 miles away. I don't be quiet. <laughs> so, yeah, we are. Yes. How, how deep do the whales go? Where is that? Well, the tag data that the Stanford's been putting on blue whales, the tag data from those studies, they go where the food is. And the food is anywhere typically between 80 and 200 meters. You know, so that, that's where those dense krill swarms form. Humpbacks, they'll come right up to the surface because, as you know, we can whale watch from Moss Landing from the beach because yeah. right at the head of the canyon, you'll have these dense schools of anchovy. Humpbacks will be feeding right at right where you're close to. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. you, you said that um, mostly only male whales sing. Is that just for humpbacks or all whales? You know, um, yeah, yeah, and I, I, just, I say I say that with a little bit of caution, just because what I things I've been reading, well, yeah, it's true. The males they put on these vocal displays is part of their ecology, and yet, I mean, how much do we know about the, you know the sounds produced by females? How do you know if they're quieter or making different sounds or making sound less frequently? There'll be a relatively smaller component of the soundscape, but in, in, as you were describing earlier, maybe harder to pull out who's making that sound. So you do need these technologies that you can put directly on whales. So his and hers suction cup hats. You know, <laughs> so you can follow two of them and, and see, well, the, yeah, does she respond to any other sounds that she's hearing? There's certainly evidence, or you know, I've seen studies where Mothers communicating with cats. I was going to say, everyone's going to want to hear a baby whale sound. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, that's that's on now top of my list. <laughs> Alexa, play baby whale sound. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's what we want. Yes. Are any of the species doing okay or doing better than others, uh, the species of whales? Yeah, humpback whales have rebounded tremendously along this coast. And, you know, maybe it's because, maybe it's because of the way they live. <laughs> they just, and the way they're able, their population is able to, to grow more rapidly. Um, gray whales, what we saw last year, they had an unusual mortality event. They've come back, their population level is pretty good, but they're having these high rates of mortality at times. And that ended up being link to the best of our knowledge now to starvation really see they they weren't getting enough food in their high latitude feeding grounds in the bering sea and further north and so when they went on their long migration they just ran out of juice and, they, and so but blue whales are still endangered fin whales are still list, listed as endangered so and how What's the range of their migration? How many miles? Thousands of miles. Thousands. Like yeah. birds. Yes, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first loop. No. <laughs> Something like that. Do you hear a lot of other non whale sounds like uh, sea lions or seals? Or like you mostly focused on whales, but are there other animals making sounds? In our exhibit at the No Exploration Center, you will hear. Sea lions barking underwater. I didn't know they barked underwater. 
Well, I heard on a hydrophone 900 meters below the surface. <laughs> yeah. And but divers would say, well, yeah, of course, they bark in my face. <laughs> but they're, they're one of the ones that release air to make sound underwater. The other guys, it's crazy. They're just moving air between air spaces. Like humpback whales have a lungs and a laryngeal sac. And they can move air between the lungs and the sac to make their sound. They don't have vocal cords, but they have tissues that vibrate when air moves past them. And here's a cool thing I saw from an engineer a uh, French engineer. It was video footage of a humpback whale cruising right toward the bottom. And then you saw air move into its forward laryngeal sac. And this animal didn't twitch a muscle, but it just went, rose up and didn't hit the bottom because it moved air, it changed the points. Yeah. So, and he wondered, here's a 70,000 pound animal that launches its entire body out of the water. Could it use movement of air into its laryngeal sac while heading toward the surface to accelerate? Wouldn't that be cool? So our humpbacks just go to Mexico or they go to Hawaii as well? Our humpbacks, or below humpbacks, go between anywhere between southern Baja and Central America, mainly Mexico. And then the Hawaii, the Hawaii uh, population is typically going up to Alaska, thereabouts. But there's more and more evidence as people start putting robots out in the ocean listening where the whales are. Look, they think there's more exchange between the breeding habitats of, say, Mexico and, and Hawaii, maybe more than we thought. Are they in the Atlantic? They're in mm -hmm. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. Humpbacks? Well, whales, I mean, we're yeah. all over the oceans. Yeah. What's happening in Australia in that area because of all the heat? And, uh, they're faring less well. Um, I haven't read anything about that. I mean, I, the ocean fortunately has great high heat capacity, it changes slowly. Whereas, so while the land lovers are going to be feeling it right away, um, maybe water quality will be affected in places that were burned and therefore get a lot more stuff in the coastal waters and that could affect feeding habitat. I haven't seen any studies on that yet. Are your wave gliders steerable or do they just go by wave action? So the wave gliders, we have, um, these are, wave-driven surface vehicles. They're produced commercially by a company called Liquid Robotics, but they have a surface float with solar panels that collect and a tether down to basically um, a, a fin. And so as the waves move this thing up and down, it drives this corpusing motion in the subsurface fin, which drives the whole thing forward. So it's propelled by wave. That's what I just wanted to fill in that picture of what it is. That's not our vehicles. We develop other autonomous vehicles. But those wave gliders, yes, they steer amazingly. And they can hold a course. Uh, as long as they've got wave power, they can hold a course in heavy winds. They're amazing. We use them, typically, we'll have them as a surface autonomous vessel that has the satellite, radio, cell communications. Those are those yellow ones parked outside the land. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And we're working with. Jupiter Research Foundation, they've got their wave gliders parked at our institute because we're deploying and recovering all the time. And we're working with them because they're developing things like microscopes that they put on these vehicles. At all, you know, searching the, the microbial world as it swims along. How much, how fast does wave, wave gliders go? Uh, about two knots. And it can hold that really well. I'm so impressed. And we often use it as a communication gateway, so it can communicate by with the world in so many different ways, and it can communicate acoustically to the vehicles that we want to keep below the surface. So it's often like a gatekeeper, uh, helping us know what's going on below the surface. Just like an applicable thing since it's a room of sailors. Uh, could you quantify the noise pollution of like a 30 foot sailboat motor? Like how far would that sound 
um, propagate and like what kinds of species might be out, uh, affected by that sound? Yeah, so, you know, I would guess, I'm not familiar so much with sailboat motors, but they're pretty small, right, typically. Yeah, and smaller motors put out higher frequencies and higher frequencies don't travel as far. But ultimately you'd have to get a, um, you'd have to model that, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, let's put a ballpark figure on it. Uh, really, so a high frequency echo location clip from a dolphin can travel a mile, let's just say that, on a mile. So, you know, it's a number of miles that a boat would be heard on. Whereas if it's low frequency, large props spinning on a container vessel uh, 25 kilometers offshore, we'll hear that. In fact, the largest container vessel to ever dock in the U.S. port, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, made its maiden voyage on December 31st, 2015, shortly after we deployed our higher pump. And my friend wanted to look, look for, listen for this giant ship. We could hear it as soon as it rounded Point Conception. Whoa. Yeah. And we could hear it all the way until it went into open. Wow. So, and it was, here's the good news. Um, it was such a massive prop and spinning at such a slow rate, especially because they wanted to time their arrival for the fanfare, so they were going extra slow. So it's putting out this below our hertz. So way below the communication channels of the email. But here's a ship that was designed to be quiet. It was designed to be giant, which means you need fewer ships to transport your goods, which is less noise. And it's putting out sound below the communication channels. Those are all winds. Um, there's a researcher in this region, Brandon Salt Southall. I don't know if you know him, but he's um, a real leader in the field, bringing together industry and academia and nonprofits, <coughs> admittedly because it's a nonprofit stupid government, but, <laughs> but the government too. But basically, they tap, they said, okay, what do we need to do to reduce ship noise? It is the single largest noise source in the ocean. Period. And we are only going to transport more and more goods by ocean. Um, so, how do you work with the manufacturers to make wider vessels, etc.? So, we, people are actually bringing all the stakeholders together. There's some legal <laughs> Can you play us one more of your favorite uh, whale songs? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. How about, um, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> got a immersion video clip, an audio clip, which is many species all together. It's the marine mammal party. <laughs> and this is where forgetting my glasses doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, now I do need your help. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, there, there, there. Oh, sorry. Oh, what I want is let's just go with this one right here, okay? All right, select it. Yeah. Thanks for being here.
Space trying to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I understood. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I was wondering, I was worried it would be like too much, too much, but usually. <laughs> Yeah, what do they call it? They call it their head?